Welcome. Welcome to Shooting Use Watermelon. Today we're going to see a practical introduction to derive macros with attributes. In the last video, we dealt with a very basic example for a derived macro. But sometimes derived macros might require some attributes to extend their behavior. For example, Surdy, the most popular serialization library in Rust, utilizes attributes to do a couple of things, such as defining a default value for a field, skipping it altogether, or defining a custom deserialization logic for a specific type of field. So in this video, we're going to try to implement a drive macro with attributes. Our throwaway example for today is going to be a metadata library. We'll have a metadata trait with a drive macro, and then we'll be able to define the author and version of the struct and each field individually. Before we start, I have to emphasize that this video is a follow-up of the previous one. That means I will skip explaining some concepts about derived macros, so I highly recommend checking it before starting this video. The first thing we'll do is to set up the simplest environment for the derived macro. So we'll first create a fresh Rust project and open it up in VS Code. And then we will create a struct named foo and derive metadata on it. The difference is, this time we will have extra attributes, specifically the author of the struct. In the main, we will create an instance of foo and print out the author of it. This author method of foo struct doesn't exist yet, so we will create metadata trait in main projects libraries file. You should have noticed this trait is public because, as I said in the previous video, mainRS is technically a different package. In order to access this trait from mainRS file, it has to be public. Another thing you might have noticed is that the author method returns a string slice with a static lifetime. That's because you need to avoid heap allocation on code generation during compile time as much as possible. If we were to use string, it would allocate heap memory. On the other hand, string slices use stack memory. You'll see we'll prefer types that allocated on stack memory in a couple of places during the video. We have exported the right macro, but its sub-project doesn't exist, so we need to create it. We will create sub-project and add it to the main project as dependency with the path. Also, we need to set the sub-project type to proc macro in its own cargotomal file. And finally, we will install all the necessary dependencies. Make sure you install these dependencies in the sub-project. At this point, you probably have realized we added two new dependencies compared to the previous video. These are proc macro 2 and the locks. Proc macro 2 is by far the easiest to explain. When we set the type of a crate to proc macro, we gain access to the built in proc macro library in Rust. Proc macro 2 is a wrapper around the built in proc macro crate. You can think of it as a modern approach to write procedural macros. The reason why we need proc macro 2 is not because we will specifically use it, it's because the locks utilizes it. What is Deluxe then? Well, it's too cumbersome to deal with procedural macro attributes. They have different kinds, parts, and styles, so they usually require tons of effort to write them. Deluxe is a procedural macro attribute parser. Just like sort of JSON parsing a piece of JSON into a native Rust type, Deluxe helps us to easily parse the attributes of a procedural macro into a native type, thus making it almost effortless to deal with these attributes. Just like the video before, we will create a macro function which will take and return token stream, and we will mark it with proc macro dry. The only difference is the extra attributes parameter. Here we will define our dry macro might require attributes starting with metadata. Since deluxe requires proc macro 2, we need to create another function to parse the input with it. We will simply name this function as metadata dry macro 2. It will take token stream as input and will return a deluxe result of token stream. You should notice we have used token stream of proc macro 2 instead of proc macro itself. The only thing we will do in the real derived macro function is to invoke metadata derived macro 2. We will pass item as input and convert it into token stream of proc macro 2. As metadata derived macro returns a result, we will simply unwrap it. Since macros are generated in compile time, this will cause compile time error if our derived macro is used in a wrong way. Finally, since metadata derived macro essentially returns the token stream of proc macro 2, we will simply convert it back into the token stream of built in proc macro. We will implement all the parsing logic inside metadata derived macro 2 function. In this function, what we will essentially do can be summarized in four steps. Just like the video before, we will convert the token stream into an abstract syntax tree. Then we will extract the attributes of struct, which is located at the top of the struct itself. Before generating the implementation code for metadata trait, we also need to define some variables, such as the identifier of the struct, generic types and lifetimes, and where clause if exists. Then finally, we will generate the implementation code. 
We will parse the token stream into derive input using parse to function in syncrate and return if the input is invalid. Parse to function helps you parse the token stream from the proc macro to crate. We will proceed to extract the outer field from the metadata struct attributes struct using the extract attributes from the lux crate and return the error if parsing the macro attributes is not successful. But we have a couple of errors. One of them is because extract attributes function requires a mutable reference, so we will change the input to a mutable reference and mark the abstract syntax tree as mutable as well. The other error is because we don't have metadata struct attributes yet, so we need to create it. This struct will only have the outer field with string type. We will derive extract attributes from deluxe and define the label of attribute. The label of attribute is ideally the same as the attribute label defined on top of the real metadata derived macro function. Now it's time to define the necessary variables to generate the implementation code. I then shouldn't be alien to you since we covered it in the last video, it's the name of the target struct. Then we will get the necessary bits from the generics field of the abstract syntax tree. Split for impl method returns a tuple with three items, those are impl generics, type generics and optional where clause. You might think our code wouldn't need this part because our target struct doesn't define any generics or where clause at all. But including these in the generated code will guarantee you cover the cases where it does exist, so it wouldn't harm to use them. Actually, this section of the code is pretty much the same most of the time if you're dealing with dry macros with attributes. We will use code to generate implementation code and wrap it with OK as our macro function returns a result. Impl block will always have this exact order, impl keyword followed by impl generics, trace name, for keyword, ident, type generics and where close. Then we will write our required author method, which will return the author variable we have extracted from metadata struct attributes. When we run the program, we should successfully print out the author of the struct. You should notice that the author parameter is mandatory. If we remove it, the whole compilation process fails. But what about an optional parameter? So let's go ahead and add a parameter named serial version to metadata attribute macro on full struct and try to print it in the main. We will print using the serial version method on metadata trait and we will generate its implementation using the serial version parameter's value. Of course, this serial version method does not exist on metadata trait, so we need to add it as well. In metadata struct attributes, we will add this new parameter on metadata macro attributes. The difference is it will have a default value in case it's not present. In the macro function now, we can simply extract it and generate serial version method. So when we run the program now, it will print out the given value. And then when we remove the given value, it will print out the default value instead. So far we've dealt with the attributes on the struct, but what about attributes on fields? Well, we have used extract attributes on the struct itself, so we can use the same function to extract macro attributes from the fields as well. All we have to do is to iterate over the fields of the struct and use extract attributes function of the locks on each. So we will add an author attribute to the only field in foo. And then we will print out the authors of every field and foo using field authors method. Of course, this method doesn't exist in the metadata trait. So we will add it and return a hash map of string slices with static lifetimes as keys and values. In our parser function, we will add an extra step to extract field attributes. We will define field attributes variable, which will return a hash map of string as the name of the each field and metadata field attributes instance. Since iterating over each field and extracting their attributes is a bit complicated, we will move its logic to its own function named extract metadata field attributes. This function will take a mutable reference to syntax tree because we will use extract attributes function from the lux and it will require a mutable reference to it. Metadata field attribute struct doesn't exist yet, so we need to create it. It will be actually almost identical to metadata struct attributes. It will have only one field called author and it will derive extract attributes and define attributes label. And we also need to define extract metadata field attributes function. As we defined in the metadata derived macro2 function, it will have the syntax tree as input and the return type will be a deluxe result of hash map with each field's name and macro attributes. The first thing we will do in this function is to define an empty hash map and return it. We will extract the attributes in the middle. Extracting the field attributes is a little bit complicated than necessary because we need to iterate over each field one by one and extract their attributes. Let's go bit by bit in order to understand what we have accomplished here. First, we validate the syntax tree we're dealing with as a struct and extract it as a struct data type. Then we iterate over each field mutably because, as I said a couple of times before, extract attributes function of deluxe requires a mutable reference to extract macro attributes. 
Then we get the field name from the fields identifier. A fields identifier is an option because if you were to deal with tuple like structs, then fields wouldn't have a name. But in our case, we know we're dealing with structs that have field names, so we unwrap it and convert it into a string. Then we extract the macro attributes into metadata field attributes and return error if it fails. Finally, we insert field name as key and macro attributes as value into field attributes variable. Back in the metadata derived macro tool function, we need to do one more thing. We need to extract each field names and authors into separate vectors. There are two reasons why we do this. Firstly, if you remember, we had field authors method on metadata trait, so we only need the author macro attributes in a vector, not all the metadata field attributes. Second reason is you can't directly use hash maps in code while you're generating code. Only primitive types and a handful of non-primitive types can be used. We can use vectors in code, so it makes sense to get keys and values as separate vectors. To achieve this, we will define a tuple of variables named field names and field authors. Each will be a vector of string. Then we will iterate over field attributes variable and we will convert each key and value into tuple of two elements. First element is the name of the field itself. The second element will be the author field of the metadata field attribute struct. Finally, we will unzip the iterator into two different vectors. Now it's time to generate field authors method and code. After we finish writing our function signature, you will probably realize there is something strange about the return type of the field authors. We have used fully qualified path to hash map instead of using hash map directly. The reason is this code will be generated character by character on compile time. And if we haven't used fully qualified path, the developers using metadata trade would also have to import hash map as well. This would lead to confusion for other developers because in their code, they wouldn't see they were using hash map anywhere, but they have to import it. So the rule of thumb for writing macros in general is to always use fully qualified paths for external dependencies even if it's on the standard library. Inside this generated method, we will unpack field names and field authors variables into fields and authors arrays. Now you might be asking, why do we use arrays instead of vectors? Actually, it's the same reason why we are returning a hash map with string slices as keys and values instead of string. Arrays allocate on stack memory while vectors allocate on heap memory. As we talked before, we need to avoid heap allocation in macros as much as possible. Now we need to do the reverse of what we have done before quote. This time we will iterate over fields, zip it with authors and collect everything into a hash map and finally return it. Notice that we have also used fully qualified path inside generated method as well. Now after all these hard work, we're coming to the moment of truth. When we run our program, we can see it prints out the field authors. We can try to add a new field and we will see its authors as well. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you found this video useful. Before we end this video, I'd like to thank Darpad Goretiti. His guidance and expertise about Precision Macros have been a great help for making this video. I would also like to inform that the macro series is stable now. We have covered all the necessary basics about writing macros in Rust. If you have any idea about the next video, you can comment down below. Also make sure to like and subscribe. See you in the next video.